Okay, so let's look again at arguments for allowing this. Um, perhaps the most famous philosophical argument is the one that comes from John Stuart Mill, the 19th century philosopher, whose most famous work is On Liberty, um, a defense of freedom of action and freedom of thought and expression. And uh, this is one particularly famous quotation in which he sets out the purpose of what he's arguing for in On Liberty. And essentially he says that uh, the only purpose for which power can willfully be exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not sufficient warrant. You might think that if you believe in individual liberty, you would try to implement this principle very hard. Um, but look at uh, uh, a variety of different acts, and you'll see that some of them are permitted and some of them are not. These are all acts which um, I think, according to Mill's principle, the state should not, um, should not prohibit. Um, so, uh, because they're acts that um, don't, don't seem to harm others. And if the state interferes, it seems to be for the good of the individual, either physical or moral. So, sexual acts between consenting adults um, generally pro were pro prohibited until relatively recently, but generally speaking, those prohibitions have now been struck down by the Supreme Court, uh, invoking the right to privacy, which is not explicitly stated in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, but has become part of the jurisprudence of interpretation. So um, uh, that began with a famous case called Griswold in Connecticut, where Connecticut prohibited the use of contraceptives between consenting adults. Uh, amazing to think now that uh, that law was still on the books, I think, in the 50s, is that right? Is that when Griswold was decided? Something like the 50s or 60s, not that long ago. Um, uh, but has now been struck down, and, and much more recently, uh, we had the Supreme Court striking down the um, uh, anti-sodomy statute of Texas, preventing, uh, preventing sodomy as a crime. Um, so there were many laws that prevented sexual acts between consenting adults, uh, which have been struck down, and you could say, well, we're getting closer to realizing Mill's views in that respect. But what about drugs? Uh, taking drugs like marijuana or heroin seems primarily to harm the person taking them. Um, it doesn't really seem to cause harm to others. Uh, whereas some drugs, perhaps, you could, you could, I think, make a better case for prohibiting alcohol on the basis of harm to others than you could for prohibiting um, marijuana or heroin because people, some people who take alcohol become more prone to violence, to attack others, and of course um, it's implicated in a huge proportion of uh, road deaths. Um, whereas I don't think that uh, heroin is implicated in road deaths very significantly, marijuana perhaps in some, but uh, not nearly as many. So. Um, why, why do we prohibit um, the taking of these substances? Um, it seems to be that we're protecting people. So it's their own physical good that we're talking about, which Mill thought is not sufficient warrant. Uh, and that's particularly clear in this case, when we require people to wear seat belts or uh, wear a helmet if they ride a motorbike. Uh, they're not going to do any harm to anyone else unless you really try to stretch this by saying, well, they're more likely to be injured, and therefore somebody will have to pay their medical costs um, if they're eligible for Medicare or Medicaid, um, the public, if not other people in the insurance pool. Um, but that seems a bit of a, a stretch, really. I think Mill would not have accepted that as an argument. Um, and yet we prohibit them. And then there's this, this one, which is what we're talking about, of course. And again, this seems to be an act which if it harms people, only harms those involved. Are we doing it really to protect the physical good of people involved? It's hard to see how it is in their physical interest. It's, it's a judgment that we're making that it's better for them to go on living when they themselves have decided that that's not the case. 
So I think if we think there is anything in Mill's principle, it ought to apply in, in uh, that situation. Now, um, what are the arguments against? I think probably what's philosophically the, the best argument against, as I said, there's some factual arguments like the slippery slope argument, um, which uh, perhaps I don't think um, you know, bears, really stands up in the light of the evidence we've now got in the last couple of decades. But um, this is an interesting argument by David Velleman that is in your reading. Um, that challenges the idea that giving people more options is always good for them. Um, and the example, the most vivid example, I think, to illustrate that is the option of fighting a duel. If you think back to um, the 18th century and I think early 19th century, um, if a gentleman thought that his honor had been slighted by somebody else, he could challenge that person to a duel and if you were challenged to a duel and you said no, then effectively you were not a gentleman of honor, or at least in some circles in society, you were considered not to be a gentleman of honor, you were considered to be a coward, and you could not hold your head up in, in certain circles. So um, having the option of fighting a duel was actually a bad thing for a person who didn't want to take the risk of being killed in a duel. And uh, that person was, was, such people became much better off when duels were prohibited and they did not have that option of fighting a duel anyway. So sometimes it's true, I think, that getting more options is a bad thing. Um, and Velleman is arguing that perhaps this is one of those cases. Um, he said, yes, firstly, well, people who might choose euthanasia may not be in a suitable condition to be offered the choice. And uh, as I say, perhaps they're being harmed by being offered this choice because now if they don't accept it, then it's their choice and they're imposing a burden on other people who have to look after them. Perhaps sometimes happens, close family members have to care for them. Uh, it's not unusual that um, uh, some family member may have to stop work um, in order to look after them, uh, harm their career in various ways, and uh, they may now feel that they are imposing a burden on others, whereas if they didn't have this choice, that wouldn't be the case. So I think that is an interesting argument, and I think it does show that there is at least a cost to the legalization of voluntary euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. But we still have to consider, is the cost sufficient to outweigh the benefits. So, because Velleman acknowledges that if, uh, if in fact many people were entitled to choose euthanasia, or if we might say it was a great benefit to them to be able to choose euthanasia, then we might have to make that option available even if to some other people it was not a benefit. So I think what Velleman is acknowledging here is that there is a weighing up of costs and benefits. How many people does it help? How many people would have been better off not having that option at all? Um, and that's a, 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 an interesting judgment. And Velleman says, for example, he, he looks at the case of the right to refuse medical treatment, which also, in, in a way, is similar. Because in some cases, you can make the decision to die by your exercising your right to refuse medical treatment. You can say, the doctor can say, we have to put, let's say, let's say that you've got um, various kinds of conditions that are causing you to be very ill, uncomfortable, needing a lot of care, and in addition to that, your kidneys start failing. So the doctor can now say, you need to go on kidney dialysis, otherwise you're going to die. But of course, you have a right to refuse dialysis. You can say, no, I don't want to go on dialysis. Yes, I know I will die, but that's what I want. Well, that gives you the same options. And you might make that decision, you might refuse dialysis, precisely because you can see that your daughter has stopped working in order to look after you. And she was at a critical point in her career where um, she may never be able to, again, have the opportunities that she would have had if she'd continued to work. And you don't want that. So 
you decide not to go on dialysis. Well, um, is it better for you to have that option or not? Um, Velleman thinks, well, we have to give people the option to refuse life-sustaining medical treatment, otherwise we're effectively allowing doctors to assault them by forcing them to have treatment that they don't want. But um, it's, it's a similar sort of balancing, weighing of pros and cons, and I think we could say if it works in one case, perhaps it works in the other case as well. Perhaps the balance is different because of the number of situations. But at least you have to look at that. Okay, um, so what you, Velleman ends up with is saying we shouldn't legalize euthanasia, but it's sometimes not wrong. Which I think is a strange situation. It's not an inconsistent to say that. But um, I think there is something strange about saying it can be justifiable to break the law, but it's better not to legalize it. Against that, I will say, um, you ha I think given that we have some states uh, and nations where it has been legalized, I think it's worth looking at the situation there. And the fact that those states and those nations have not rescinded the law suggests that on balance they do think it's desirable. In the Netherlands, for example, there have been a succession of different governments that have held office since that law was passed, including for a time a more conservative government that was headed by a Roman Catholic Prime Minister. But that government did not attempt to rescind the le euthanasia legislation because they recognized that it was popular among the electorate as a whole and it would not have been politically feasible to do so. 